questions, but half of them are going to get thrown out because they were for Zoe. Yes. Or we can talk about that <laughs> independently. Yes, yeah, Zoe Tickle was supposed to be the third yes. participant. Um, he's down with COVID, so we both agreed that it's best if she doesn't join. We wish her the best and fastest recovery. Um, and hopefully, end of May or June, we will do a second round with her and talk about distributive justice. Just like live topics. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing Saturday night in a bar or something to make it like extra entertaining. Right. So yeah, as a result of that, tonight we have one amazing panelist. <laughs> <laughs>
try. Hi, uh, my name is Stefan Miley. I'm a banker. I have worked predominantly in risk management. Uh, the reasons I'm here, besides I'm a big fan of Peter uh, is the following. So I am very interested in philosophy. That's something I'm doing on the side. And I'm very interested in questions around um, centralization versus decentralization and aggregation of opinions or, or voting. Um, and it's, it's definitely partially informed by the fact that I grew up in Switzerland, which has a very, let's say, different mechanism around decision making, how they uh, integrate both a bottom of highly decentralized decision making process with a more, let's say, top down traditional parliamentary system. Uh, and um, I think this, uh, if we go back to uh, Tyler Cowan, it would be underrated uh, in my perspective. So those are kind of the, the drivers uh, behind the, my presence here tonight. Hi, um, I'm Anna, I'm a founder at CEO of Ecoenzyme. Um, I wish we did more crypto related um, events. Um, I think we are so kind of wet too that some of the web people uh, steer clear of us. Um, this event came out of a discussion that the I had about this beautiful piece that you wrote a couple of years ago about John Rawls. Um, and I, it really, really deeply made me think because I felt that, you know, our current kind of discourse is, it corners people into these two polarities. Half of the people are extremely pro um, disruption. They even want to disrupt things they don't fully understand, like the economic system or education. Um, and the other half is much more fearful and protective of old values and old institutions. Um, and one of the criticisms from the more anti-progress side um, is that tech has not really resolved uh, economic redistribution. That's something you know that they fear that this is going to lead to an even worse outcome. Um, and in your piece, you basically showed that there might be something else there that we haven't noticed, even though it's literally staring into your face in the form of John Rawls, which is you know, uh, probably the most canonized person in the liberal democratic discourse, and that there might be something in crypto beyond the high that in the long run, once those currently fringe ideas become institutions, because fringe ideas tend to do that across time scales, um, that there might be a deeper kind of resolution to these problems than we think. Um, and to me, as a good arch Hegelian, always lo loving to marry two polarities into something that actually makes sense for real people, I felt that your piece did that. Um, and you know, we really wanted to invite Peggy because in your great online game piece, you create the synthesis, right? To say, this is the map, guys, and deal with it. And nobody else bothered to map it. Um, and I think there's no understanding crypto and who goes into crypto for what and what happens at the end when crypto releases the new individual with the new knowledge. And I think we can only really understand that in a map. Where is this person coming from? Banking, bio, but also science and ethics. You know, economists working in tech because they will have a very different crypto experience and their utility in that system and what they should learn and really learn. Um, my name's Adam. I'm a uh, postdoc with the Heterodox Academy, and I uh, do research on Rawlsian political liberalism. Um, I don't really engage with issues of uh, with cryptocurrency, so I came here mainly because I'm a fan of the inter intellect uh, salons and also just um, for exploratory purposes. I'm Laura. Um, I came here and I'm a fan of Angel Intellect, all the two salons. Um, and I'm a product manager at a tech, at a crypto company. Um, I just started a couple months ago. So I've been in financial technology for most of my career, but the Web3 angle is, is different. Um, and part of the company mission is to help make crypto data accessible to all. And that's a really big challenge because there's some early adopters that love it and they're super fanatics about it. but even for me, like even going opening up this product for the first time, going on the site, I did not know what I was looking at. Like the user experience was just not intuitive at all. And so I think there's still a lot of work that can be done. A lot of work has been done on the Web2 side, and people are really accustomed to like basically a standardization, standardization of how things look and feel. 
um but we're still locking that i think in the web three space and so yeah just kind of a crossover of different worlds but that is ui from a quick summary Thanks to everyone. Uh, I can do a quick intro too. Yeah. So I'm Lee. I am a investor full time in crypto. Um, run a fund called Variant, which invests in early stage crypto startups. Um, I've been investing. <laughs> I've been investing in startups since 2016. Have invested across the Web2 and now crypto. Um, spent the first four years of my investing journey at Andrew Horowitz, where I was investing on the consumer team. So, um, met you know every consumer marketplace that set out to raise between the years 2016 and 2020. Met every single social networking startup that was raising at that period of time. And so, um, now try to bring a lot of that awareness and knowledge to what I do. Unless they come up with natural Yeah. Maybe yeah. I, I'm going to flip it already on you. <laughs> <laughs> crypto, I'm only a master after kind of being a general speaker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. charge of the panel. <laughs> yeah. No, I just think it's like a fascinating, like, just <laughs> like, why crypto only things for you. Yeah. Um, so my transition to being a crypto investor happened really organically where I had started my own fund in 2020. It was investing against this thesis of like platforms and the future of work, which is why my writing, a lot of it concerns the platform economy, how it impacts society, workers, <coughs> and, and around that period of time, 2020, was when crypto started to collide with the world of the consumer for the first time, really ever, um, in the form of NFTs and tokens and like other consumer applications. And I really saw it through this lens of the future of work a new type of work that people could access on the internet permissionlessly and earn through tokens, not just earning dollar-denominated income. Um, and I thought that was very cool, so I just started to invest in crypto projects opportunistically, and then that escalated, and I invested in a lot of crypto projects, <laughs> and I gradually found myself like really spending all my time thinking about crypto. Um, so that's how I like went down the rabbit hole and became a full-time crypto investor. How do I like it? It's been a wild journey, um, to say the least, over the last like four-ish years. Um, I guess some like additional context is a big part of what drew me to crypto investing in the first place was this potentiality that I saw to create a fairer world. A fairer world meaning um, more aligned with like the principles of distributive justice. Um, a world that was more egalitarian, that would open up access to opportunities to more people, and would even the playing field for anyone, anyone who had an internet connection would be able to participate in these networks and earn ownership, versus like a rarefied set of people who were in Silicon Valley, knew the right people or the right projects to invest in, etc. And so I really saw it as this tool to catalyze a fair, more just world. And then we can debate, like, okay, how's that played out or not? Like, what do we see happening in reality and how does that jive with that original vision? Um, but that was really what drew me to crypto in the first place, um, especially after four years of investing in Web2 platforms where a lot of them sold themselves as uh, mechanisms to empower individuals. But instead, I could see that they were, I mean, they did that on the margin. I think they were a step in the right direction, but they were still exploitative in many ways. And like I've written papers about this, about how there's like forms of collective action and a labor movement that's playing out in the platform economy because individual creators or workers don't feel like they really have a say in the platform's policies or how much they get paid. And so I view crypto as this way to actually build a system and platforms that would be user-owned and user-governed that would also share their economics more yeah. with their participants. So that was what I saw. Anyways, tossing it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite elegant. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Talk to me about you. I mean, I would love to hear how you got interested in crypto. Like, what were the philosophical or ideological strands that you saw in crypto that appealed to you? Yeah. So I uh, also got uh, bought a bunch of Bitcoin back in 2013. I read Fred Wilson's blog post about he has to be investing in Coinbase. I was at Bank of America and I couldn't like really trade actively, but I knew they didn't know about Coinbase, and so I was like, I'm just going to buy a bunch of Bitcoin. Yeah. And then I went uh, on a trip to Oktoberfest and I quit my job and my friend still worked in finance and we spent a bunch of money one night. And so I woke up on over in Munich the next morning and was like, I'm just going to pay for this trip by selling these two Bitcoin until 38 Bitcoin for like 150 bucks each. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now I've finished prices. Um, <laughs> 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 Economy and the future of work. 
Yeah, maybe crypto was not. not yeah, like crypto was not yet embedded in that one, but I probably tweeted like mashing up okay, <laughs> crypto yeah. and, and disruptive innovation. Um, but yeah, I think like I I often cite Clay Christensen and just his ideas around disruptive innovation and like uh, what is it, low end innovation versus. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember the two <laughs> yeah. disruptive innovation. But anyways, I talk about Clay Christensen a lot. And I'm sure I've like talked about <laughs> crypto and Clay Christensen. If anybody wants to anybody watching Oh yeah, because it's like yeah. He, he usually talks about this idea of like there's the cheaper entrant and it sucks yeah. at first yeah. and then eventually it gets better and better and people are like, this doesn't do anything, but all of a sudden does do something that does a lot more. But like Bitcoin or you know, as a first one was kind of like slower yeah. and like it's almost the other version it's like that yes. it has this powerful capability and then it's like worse in terms of a bunch of other functionality that normally it's sort of like the reverse of this yeah she talks about how like the, the innovation often gets dismissed initially because people are comparing it versus the old incumbent along the same axis so they're like it's worse along all these dimensions it like takes worse photos it's like um, yeah, things like that. And what they don't, what they neglect to point out is that it's actually superior. The innovation is superior along a di- different basis of competition, he says. And so, yeah, I, I think that, like he talks about the iPhone, the early iPhone mm-hmm. as an example of this, which people dismissed as a camera versus old digital cameras. And then what people miss is that actually it excels along different dimensions. And then the thing that it's sucky at, like it actually gets better at over time. But, um, okay, let's park Clay Christensen there. <laughs> Wait, I'll do one Clay Christensen. <laughs> <laughs> How do you view mean coins in the context of that whole thing mm-hmm. and in terms of like, the next big thing we'll start with the toy? Yeah. Uh, I, I, don't disrupt, I don't know if, I would have to think about it a little bit more in terms do mean coins disrupt something. But I actually think the other um, idea from Clay Christensen that does apply to mean coins is the idea of jobs to be done. Hmm. So if you guys have read Clay Christensen on the jobs to be done framework, he talks about how people hire a product to fulfill a job to be done. Um, And I think there was an example that he gave of like milkshakes in the morning when people were driving to work. Uh, yes, where uh, a bunch of like people at the milkshake company, <laughs> the fast food restaurant, were trying to figure out um, like how can we sell more milkshakes in the morning? We're, we're noticing that these customers buy milkshakes on the way to work at like 2 a.m. And so they tried a bunch of different ways to improve the milkshake, like offering different flavors or whatever. But when they actually asked people about their morning milkshake routine, it turned out like they actually wanted a milkshake that was like slower to drink because they were hiring it to do the job of entertaining them on a long commute to work. It was actually a feature that it was like kind of thick and like slow to drink and slow to melt. And it was like entertainment for their tongues while they were driving (laughs) during the morning commute. And so when you know the job to be done that your product is serving, you can like better cater it to serve that purpose. And so, okay, applying that to meme coins, I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think the job to be done of meme coins, well, it's, it's many folds, but I think one of the jobs of meme coins that people don't really see is the entertainment job. People think that meme coins are, I don't know, I, I don't really know what people think. <laughs> they, they have lots of negative feelings about them. They feel like people are, you know, they don't lose a lot of money. But I actually think that they are an entertainment product. And it is prevalent throughout society to spend a lot of money on entertainment products without any hope of like financial gain. Just because it's an act of entertaining yourself, maybe it's an act of self-expression to get certain <coughs> content. And I think there is an element of main points which fulfill that role. Totally. I wrote a piece a while back on like, when meme stocks are hot, crypto, all of that, really. Like, a lot of these products, and even Tesla stock is this, and other things are this, where like, mm-hmm. you're not just buying like the disc, the present value of, of future cash flows, but you're buying that, 
plus the entertainment provides you, plus what it yeah. says about you that you're part of this yeah. thing. And so like, it actually makes sense to retail investors be willing to pay a little bit more yeah. for something it provides for those things. Totally. Yeah. And so, okay, tie in disruption then. So I have an answer now. Like, through the lens of financial entertainment, you could say that uh, meme coins disrupt traditional equities, mm-hmm. which also have this layer of entertainment as part of the value proposition. And through the lens of um, low end disruption, you would say that meme coins are inferior to traditional equities along many dimensions. They are. Okay, actually, it's fun to like be able to say that. It's illegal to actually use them to fund a private right? Yes. Uh, it's illegal to build a roadmap around them. Like, yeah. You can't depend on the efforts of others. Um, they don't have any cash flows. Like, yeah. There's no revenue generation. They're really volatile. But they actually excel along some other dimensions. They're tradable 24 um, 7. Maybe the volatility is actually a, uh, like a, a feature, not a bug, to many participants. Um, there's like an enhanced community element to them, given that they're so internet native and often birthed on forums and on social networks um, in a way that like equities can't provide that same level of real time entertainment for social value. Yeah. yeah. So one of my clients does have a product. I don't want to name it because, you know, right. like, but, um, but it, it does have a, a meme coin element to it. And I think one of the things we've been talking about is this idea of like, Equity is sort of like one alternative comparison to meme coins. Another alternative comparison is like uh, fantasy sports, right? And the idea of I, you know, I, I, my friends are in like fantasy league, and I'm just trying to get into it. And it was like hard for me to get excited about it and like research all the players and what they're doing. But it's sort of like that's the whole point. It's like it forces you to get invested in it and keep track and like make new decisions based on the information that's coming out. And I think there's like room for meme coins to have the same kind of like oh, something's happening to it. what's the new story, what's the new narrative. Like, the reason why college football is such a big deal is because ABC and the, the broadcast networks figured out how to get the story. Like, oh, this is an old rivalry, or this quarterback got hurt, and now we're back, you know, like, and now we're invested because, like, there's a story. Who cares about some random team and some other team in places I've never been to, schools I didn't attend, like, yeah, yeah. but now there's a narrative behind it, and I'm, I care. And so, like, to the degree that we care about these things that sort of have no, that, you know, real value. Baseball cards have no real value until you attach a narrative to it. Right. That's another way in which, like, you could argue meme points excel along a different basis of competition than equities or other asset classes. It's just the variety that's offered, mm-hmm. where there's something for everyone. There is, like, you know, there are thousands of meme points getting created every single day, whereas in the equities world, you're restricted to a much narrower set of options that don't allow for the full range of entertainment or self-expressivity that oh. meme points would. Yeah. That yeah. actually makes a lot of sense. Relay that back to E16Z. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys notice any like competitiveness from more traditional vehicles of financing to kind of try to be as entertaining or cool? Is it like do you notice like the grandfather trying to, you know, compete with the teenager? I, mean, I think you see this in, in the traditional financial markets too, where like a ton of equities trade like mean stocks or mean coins, mm-hmm. where they're priced in a way that is like just so it defies traditional laws of physics in terms of valuation, that you have to assume that there's like mean value, community, momentum, et cetera, mm-hmm. driving these values. I mean, like the Trump. Yes. The, the Trump social. So true social. True social. It's like back up, actually. It went up, crashed, and now it's back up again. Um, and that one is purely, I mean, the company <laughs> stock shit. You know, the whole thing is like not a real, real company. It's purely yeah. a mean. I think part of it, too, is that like, I don't think it's a response as much as they were both kind of like, I mean, coins, I guess, started around that same time like the original ones. Like, just both products and everybody being thrown online all the time. So, like, Robinhood is kind of like a meme product generally, like a meme your way to trade any, any equity. Um, and kind of new coins came out at the same time. So, it's just like a natural consequence of everybody being yeah. online all of the time talking about this stuff. And, and we didn't keep entertaining about products that are, to most people, like, you know, some of us not very interesting, but then most people, like, 
Yeah, we have kind of a lot, a lot of different selects. Oh, yeah. um, I'm sure I still don't know the the mics. Um, but we also did this recently an event with Morgan Housel, and we basically, basically all we talked about was psychology, right? Like this is entertainment. This is people's identities or self-image, how they see the world. It, it is expressed in these little things. Yeah. Okay. I want I want to zoom out of just talking about eating points. <laughs>
mass redistribution of wealth, we're seeing concentration of wealth play out in a different arena, albeit maybe with a different set of folks, which is cool. I think that's maybe an another argument uh, we could put forward why we have conundrum between left and right or libertarian conservatives. So um, I think on the, let's say, let's say left, there's always a concern that there is a significant um, asymmetry of information between the different types of investors, small investors versus large institutions. That's investors, and there is a group that the small investors that need to be protected. Um, and uh, another that's the issue is that I think there is a concern that if you have a sort of asymmetric information in the market, you have a moral, moral hazard and uh, uh, adverse selection issues, so the market could easily let say, let's say break down. And uh, who will put the ball in the back is usually then let's say, the people who are let's say, less informed. So I think. It, that's why it straddles kind of the, the whole libertarian left yeah. right because depending on is it the perspective you are taking, uh, you, uh, you can easily end up on the opposite side mm -hmm. um, of the spectrum. Yeah, that's right. But I guess despite the concentration, there are more user owners of the projects than Uber or Facebook or whatever else you can get over. I mean, I thought like, was, in any venture fund that was around at the time, you know, pitch LPs was their you know, software was this great return, but like also incredible for users who had just been trading on this platform and then just got airdrop thousands and thousands of dollars. And that happens over and over and over again. Today, everyone's mad, and I think this is actually, to your point about protecting the little guy, up in the US gets like horrendously wrong. Today, Eigenmayer announced it's like in the US investors yeah. aren't allowed to receive an airdrop, yeah. not buy something, but aren't allowed to receive an airdrop, which is just insane. So I think like there are a lot of things that are human nature problems with her, but I think it's really great at exposing the worst of human nature because it's like the internet, which is great at that, and then you add money, which is also like, separately great at it, and you can buy them, and it's, it's bad at that. But I think a lot of the shortcomings are regulation just makes it like, very, very, very hard to build things like in the way that you want to actually yeah. build them. I agree. Right. But maybe the, yeah, the step in the right, right direction. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it, it still has all of the potentiality that we outlined. Do you think on the, the governance side, on the economic side, on whichever way you think is most important, it's getting better? Because like one of the things that also attracts me to is like I, I think just experimentation and variance are just like great things generally and like the crypto is this really awesome little like lab for experimenting with different mechanism designs and different government governance models and all of that in like a fairly low stakes way that you can then like kind of apply more broadly hopefully over time. Do you think that we're like actually like evolving our way to better systems than maybe like two years ago or, or four years ago or six years ago? It's all the space. Um, I mean, this is just like firsthand what I'm seeing in the space. I, I think a lot of builders have become quite disillusioned with the idea of decentralizing governance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're much more interested in decentralizing economic rights, yeah. giving users like some exposure to economic value through tokens versus conferring governance rights via tokens. I think like the prior ministry of governance to date like hasn't panned out in the way that anyone would have hoped for. There's like very very low user participation, um, engagement in governance. There's a lot of overhead to participating in governance, just like how none of us like vote mm -hmm. for the shareholder decisions for any of the stocks that we own yeah. in our portfolios, right? Like it's it's become like very politicized and professionalized mm -hmm. crypto governance. Yeah. Um, and so I don't see as much innovation there. I think instead it's more of a resignation. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is interesting, right? Like, there's something I have to make in the uh, GitHub has the same problems, right? Like there is the kind of clerical class, the admin work that nobody wants to do. And then, yeah. but then how do you express that? Like, it's, I mean, it's, 
everywhere from voting with the shards of clay in ancient Greece to crypto governance. Like, okay, but if you don't want to do the job, what, how should you criticize those who do? Yeah. I. Wikipedia had the same problem. Like, I, I remember because I'm old. I was <laughs> there. It was the same thing. Like, there are like four guys who want to do it. And then do you agree with them or not? Yeah. But not four, sorry, viewers. 400. <laughs> <laughs> But it's yeah. really small. No, but it, totally. You can give them the rights, and they don't use it. Yeah, would it, I think that's like a, just a very interesting. Like, would the best governance mechanism and economic mechanism around like actually encourage ninety percent participation in any of this? Probably not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if use, like user governance solves an actual problem. Yeah. That. Like, I don't know if there was actually a job to be done there. Like, I think the governance token thing solves a regulatory <laughs> job to be done there. <laughs> to mitigate the problem how we around dependence on the efforts of others. Um, but I don't know if it's ever been validated that users actually want to govern anything that they use. Yeah. I mean, I think it makes it way harder for, I mean, like, if you go full decentralization, I love mm. Obviously, the progressive decentralization piece, but like going full decentralization early means that you just like completely handed over control of everything, yeah. and no product, good product decision has ever been made that way. Mm. Did I spot Alex Summerno like the rig culture war thread, oh, the yeah. famous old uh, blog post about how it will be like four fanatics taking over who have the time and the motivation, <laughs> and you, a normal person who has a job, a family, and like other things to live for, stand no chance. Because this other person will be like there 22 hours a day. Totally. And just. I, I think about that a lot with like, you know, the Web2 platforms of saying like democratizing X. Whenever you hear yeah. that word like democratizing X, <laughs> you're like, okay, so you're going to make it a lot easier. And eventually a bunch of people are going to figure out how to like kill it. At this <laughs> and then those people will dominate the hell out of it. And everyone else will be like nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. Like. I, that was the last time I went from my own first startup, like we were doing long distance ride sharing, which is like more egalitarian because like you're actually driving your own car and you really are going from San Francisco to LA, you really do have only a couple of seats and you can't do this all the time. So this was like truly a peer to peer activity. And at the same time we're seeing Lyft and Uber emerge and you're like, that kind of looks like, they call themselves ride sharing, but it's like, it kind of looks like a taxi. Yeah. And then of course it turns into, I'm doing on the weekends too. I'm a full-time driver, and this yeah. is just my job. I just drive around, and I'm a taxi company, you know. And, and it's sort of like the idea that we will always convert. Every marketplace will converge into like power yeah. suppliers and power like buyer. You know, it's just like a buying class, and there's no like amateur. Not a lot of room for amateurs. Can I been saying that this bit of democracy? Like every time we try to reinvent democracy in a small way. So like right. trying to decide what the family should eat to <laughs> have a crypto government you know, app, it just destroys itself. And then you start valuing like John Ross's whole thing and the system a little bit more. Like it's like fighting entropy like crazy. Oh, you mean like democracy it doesn't exist in some of these areas of our life, but it's when you try to make it, it almost always like we I mean I was not yeah. born into a democratic system, but you know here. It's, it's supposed to be that. And, and sometimes I'm like, this is as unlikely as like the evolution of Homo sapiens. <laughs> everything tries to kill this. And you know, Paul Bertolanti, the, the great um, systems um, engineer, has has this um, um, has these like quips that you want know, to understand the system, remove one part or try to like, build it from scratch. And you know kids even in the kindergarten try to create democratic systems like Today, Joanna decides what you play, and, the, and it, it never works. <laughs> like humans are kind of hardwired against boring institutions. Yeah, they want to be not boring. Like, along those <laughs> lines, like the best companies in the world are not run as democracies exactly. so internally. But the fact that we have the big one is to me a miracle. Yeah, and I'll never take it for granted. Agree. Okay, I want. I have another question that I wanted to ask Becky. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you've written this piece. In about, I think it was actually titled Fighting Capitalism on Capitalism. But yeah. Capitalism on Chain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you argue in that, <coughs> that crypto's ideal state is to make capitalism more effective. 
Um, it'd be great to hear you talk about that ideal and also like how you think that's played out in crypto. So the way that I thought about that ideal was, I mean, it's this financial technology. I think, you know, like as I was writing the article, like point number one is like capitalism is good. So you could disagree with that, and, and if you disagree with that, like, the rest of the article wouldn't make much sense. It'd be like, why do we want to make this thing more effective? But capitalism is, is, is like the, the number one thing there. Number two is capitalism can be improved. So like the Industrial Revolution was amazing. If you look at like the GDP growth chart, it's incredible, and it's actually even better per capita. Like, GDP after the Industrial Revolution, amazing. Kids worked in, six-year-old kids worked in factories and died, and you know, things were miserable. And Ford, you know, and a bunch of other people, and there were labor unions and all that, but like, even Ford, because <coughs> he wanted to improve worker productivity and morale, was like, you know what, actually, we're this like 40-hour work week and we're gonna improve worker conditions because I actually think it'll make my people more productive, and so like, that was an improvement. Or we didn't have venture capital, and now you have like, a bunch of people who want to just give a bunch of money to people experimenting and trying a bunch of different things. Like, that's a, an improvement versus like trying to start something ambitious and having to go to a bank and explain like your crypto project to a bank yeah. and like, make that happen. Like it just wouldn't happen. So the capitalism's great, capitalism can improve. And I, this is like early uh, early in using AI to like be a thought partner piece. So I was like, what are like the things that you would do to improve capitalism? It's like global access to capital, lower barriers to entry, and this list of like ten different things. And all of the first seven like had very clear, like crypto done right actually does this yeah. thing. Like clearly low barriers to entry, you can spin something up, you build a permissionless network. There are, you know, right now as we speak, people around the world trading and, and doing whatever uh, on crypto protocols and I'm gonna forget the other five, like five other things uh, down down the list. Uh, property rights. And so I think actually one of the big things with crypto, whether you think it's like done anything good or not yet, is whether you take the internet seriously. And so like it does give all of these things to the internet that like yeah. exist in the real world that didn't really exist on the internet, one of which was stronger property rights. And so if you like go through the list, if it works, crypto can help mm -hmm. do all of these things that make capitalism more efficient. Like a very dumb recent not dumb, cool, mm -hmm. but like minor uh, recent example is like going to strike announcing that they're going to be using USDC uh, to accept payments. And like, if you look at the, I mean, they, they charge 99 cents, but the actual transaction fee was like less than a cent on, on Solana. And so like, if you just take 3% transaction fees out of everything that happens on the internet, like, what does that do to the amount of, uh, the amount of stuff that, that people buy? Obviously, it's really great for Stripe's margin. Maybe you can like use that as a wedge to take on these and match your for Stripe, but just for like, the economy and increasing the GDP of the internet, mm -hmm. like taking a 3% fee out of everything is like very good. Um, and the fact that we built these systems, like you can make an argument that stable coins alone are worth all of the investments that have gone into crypto so far. They're cross border, low cost, uh, people in, you know, my sister runs a fintech company in Africa, like just want to get paid in USDC. Um, we have an energy company in Africa that is getting killed by in Nigeria. It's getting killed by the fluctuations in the Naira, and they're just immediately converting the money they make into into USDC. And so, like that alone, I think is worth so much. Um, and I think that's like one early example because it's the simplest um, things that over time, like as the kinks get worked out. Like a few years ago, we said stable coins really like you mean tether like <laughs> that thing that people use to like get leverage on bitcoin like what like that is like a scam mm -hmm. or whatever and now it's just this thing that like people all over the world are accepting and using marketplace shutting use and all that and so i think like that kind of stuff over time happens yeah. uh with more and more pieces of right that's really interesting i thought where you were going to go with um, making capitalism more effective was around how markets can function better and how crypto can be applied to tackle sources of market failure that exist in the world right now. Yeah. So that was that was one of the okay. yeah, yeah that was that was one of the points uh, one of the points as well. But could expand on, on what you right. Like so in economics, there's this idea where like you know markets aren't always efficient. Um, sometimes markets can clear at points that are not optimal um, from like a societal welfare perspective. And why would that happen? Like the reasons why that happened are to do with, um, for instance, if there's positive or ex negative externalities that aren't fully reflected in the supply demand chart. There's
there's also um, information piece in the trade. For instance, if the seller has information about a good, quality of their car, whatever, that the buyer doesn't have, then the clearing price is not the optimal one. I think there's like other reasons why markets might fail. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, I was super curious because like, my memory of like the early days was like the, the, one, the main one was like sort of interest rate stability, like the same uh, logic as like the gold standard. So I was like curious to hear that missing from your list, you know, and we just came out of a, a pretty good soft landing, I think, like the Fed did an amazing yeah. job, I thought, and so, it's funny to hear that sort of like swept under the rug. I'm just like curious your take on that feeling. Is like, is that like a, is that no longer a goal of crypto or? Uh, Which piece? Interest rate. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. The predictability of the money supply. Or inflation. That's on the. Yeah, I think on the Bitcoin side, certainly. Yeah. And I think even if the Fed did a great job, like there's still a lot of people, you know, like. You'd rather own Bitcoin than yen right now, I guess, for mm-hmm. most of the currencies in the world. And I think sure. there's still a lot of Bitcoin true believers who think that's where the US is heading, but we're just the most the least bad currency right yeah. now. And so there's like the like the dollar. But um, yeah, I think for a certain group of people, that ability to like own one of twenty one million and the fact that it gets linear and linear each time and people say ETH is gonna knock off Bitcoin or something else is gonna happen and it doesn't. I think like one of the things I was worried about and the reason I wasn't super interested in Bitcoin at all was like, yeah, that, that is one that you can make any number of tokens. We talked about how many mean points you can make. And so like you own one of 21 million of those, but like there's trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of these other tokens. I think the longer it lasts is kind of like the, the gold standard cryptocurrency. I think that becomes more and more valuable. But that, I think the other side of that is if you get to a spot where like, you own Bitcoin because the dollar is falling apart. Like, who gives a shit that you own Bitcoin because like, the world is in a good yeah. Yeah, yeah. place? Yeah. Since I, I, I yeah. that argument. That's like, I, I don't know, I like, I, I go back and it's my own two minds here. like kibbutz is an Like, people say kibbutz can't last without capitalism because, like, they have private companies and kibbutz to give them money. I wonder if like, Bitcoin can't last without the US government backing the US dollar and, like, creating stable markets all around the world. What do you mean? Like in my mind, Bitcoin thrives when there's not a stable dollar. Mm. Like when there is anticipated um, uh, like inflation. Yeah. It, it basically serves as an inflation hedge. Yeah. But do you think like there would be it would be as big a market if like if the US dollar was just like I think I mean, like, it, it, I mean maybe that requires to get kickstarted, right? Like, you know, I think there's I like think a difference between like it's almost like cafe stuff when you're talking about like just like a little bit of inflation or something. It's kind of like, oh, we're all pretending the government's fucked. But like if that actually happened, then like <coughs> then things are really bad. And I don't know like what you trade your Bitcoin yeah. for. If like yeah. you know, the US government falls apart and stops protecting shipping lanes and whatever. Yeah. So like right. what do you even buy with it? Yeah. Well, like the dollar has a thing that like I can pay back my taxes with US dollar. Like that's written in the dollar bill. But like, what does the Bitcoin have like that? You know, like, I think as long as the rest of the system is somewhat functioning as someone who's willing to pay me any number of currencies for you know, this thing, like there is enough shared belief in the thing that I do think it has as value in owning one of that open number supply is useful. But that's an interesting question. That's a very Hegelian question. <laughs> like, does it need this kind of opposite to exist, right? Like, would, would crypto have, have started, I don't know, in some extremely volatile dictatorial system where, I don't know, or like something like that. Would, would it have started in Argentina or Russia or a place where, you know, there's a, a base distrust um, towards the financial system? Um, or do you need this kind of uncle there um, where, you know, if you want out of crypto, you can always sell it for a dollar? Um, and, I mean, yes, the cafe, I, I love this. Like, yeah, but sometimes there's an uproar that everything is falling apart and the Fed is going to kill us. And that it doesn't happen, and everybody forgets, and we move on, right? Uh, it's more for the entertainment value, I think, to like pronounce your values, right? Um, it's a very, very good question. I would, I would read a Hegelian 
yeah, as long as we have a strict policy probability that the US government can't pay back the debt, mm. there will be always a reason for an alternative currency to become to exist. Mm. I just think that it, as the probability changes, mm. uh, you will have a, a, a cross effect on, 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 on Bitcoin. And as long as you, we see at this point, there is a path where probably at some point, uh, if there's not a significant change in, in policy, that the US will inflate itself out of debt. Um, and this, I think, has a fairly decent probability. I think there is a good reason to have an alternative currency. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. It's not saying it doesn't make it more efficient. This will make yeah. it more efficient, but like understanding the dynamic is I'm sort of curious about that. That's sort of important, it seems mm. like. Uh, yes, I think it's, it, 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 as, a, as a Swiss, I have a, a different <laughs> perspective. I, I <laughs> if, if all the governments would, uh, let's say, work like the, the Swiss government, where, let's say, uh, there is a, a, a clear um, codification um, that the, the central bank only has to uh, provide a stable currency and not work with the trade-off between, let's say, unemployment rate mm -hmm. uh, uh, and stable interest rate, um, where uh, you are prone to, um, let's say, overshoot. Um, it's much less likely that you run into those problems if you have let's say, a debt break where the fiscal debt cannot go beyond a certain level, like let's say in Switzerland, Germany has a, 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 a similar rule. I don't think that you have, you have a very hard-coded commitment that a scenario like we could have in the United States can actually not happen in, let's say, in Switzerland, or you would have to make significant changes to the Constitution, which is highly unlikely. So I think as long as the United States has a weak com commitment to stability, you will have, I think, uh, still a, uh, uh, a good reason to have an alternative currency in place. Can we go back to the stablecoin point? Because I've heard a lot about stablecoins, but I don't fully understand what it means to have a stablecoin and for this new stripe like change. Like it's, it's, it seems like you're sort of bypassing the need to you're like somehow secretly transmitting the dollar without having to like exchange anything, right? Like that you're like I don't know. Can you so mm -hmm. there's different ways to do stable coins, and they're like you know, you're Luna that's like trying to do algorithmic stabilization, and that broke and and fell apart. Um, I think starting with like why why do we even Stablecoins, like why are stablecoins <laughs> important? Um, stablecoins, yeah, like stablecoins acknowledge that basically, like the users of crypto exist in the real world. They have real costs. Those costs are typically denominated in a currency like the U.S. dollar. Um, that you know, there's a whole monetary policy around that attempts to have the dollar be stable against some real world basket of goods. And so, anyway, it would be useful to have a token that is on chain that reflects the value of one US dollar, because then you could, for instance, like pay people across borders in something akin to a dollar or pay people's salaries in this stable coin um, and just have an on-chain mechanism for reflecting this currency that is very ubiquitous. So that's like the primary function of a stable coin. They're used for payments, remittances, um, like a ton of contractors will accept payment in stable coins when you know, integrating global payments is, is too difficult. And so, yeah, Paki was just starting to elaborate on all the different mechanisms that exist to actually create a stable coin, how, to, how do these stable coins get constructed on chain? And, yeah. I mean, and so there's like complicated and so far, I guess, DAI has been successful and that's more complicated than a USDC. But, uh, I mean, really like the most common way is that you put a dollar essentially in like a circle's bank account, or their separate bank account, or USDC, which is the other than the other, which is the globally most popular, the most popular kind of like US based uh, stable coin. You put a dollar in their account, you get a token back that's now in circulation. It's also for circle the greatest business model in the world because they turn around and deposit this like 
pile of $60 billion and then buy treasuries with it and just make it. Circle's running USDC. Yeah, Circle yes. is a centralized company. I think it was started by a consortium of various companies, including Coinbase, that operates and manages USDC, which is the lead stable coin. And so, yeah, every USDC token is backed by one US dollar sitting somewhere in a bank account. So and what the so dollar was supposed to do with gold before it? Right. Program. Yeah, it's actually, it's one-to-one pegged, like backed by a dollar um, in a bank. And the reason why Stripe or, you know, some other companies are choosing to use stable coins including USDC for payments is because you can settle much more cheaply um, on chain than you can in the real world via like ACH or whatever other payment rails exist. Yeah, through you know the card networks is is a big one. And cheap is part of it and fast is part of it. Like in the demo they showed, like the creator got the ninety nine dollars in their wallet immediately. Um, mm. And I guess it, you know, if the creator wasn't, I don't know if they have a wallet to wallet on Stripe yet, but at least Stripe knows that the money is in their account immediately and then can pay out the, the creator immediately. And so I, I think you know, Visa makes incredible margins, MasterCard makes incredible margins, <coughs> so just tapping into this like shared infrastructure. Circle doesn't need to charge anything because they make a ton of money on treasuries and then the blockchain. That is a really, yeah, that's a really interesting ecosystem. Yeah. I want, so I want to reorient us uh, <laughs> to philosophy. We can talk about crypto. We haven't even talked about like this joke tweet when he announced he started an online bank. Oh, I forget what that tweet was. <laughs> Did you get like checks? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm going to reorient. Focus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when Zoe was going to be a panelist, here. I really okay. wanted to talk about her paper, um, which I encourage all of you guys to read. It's called The Normative Gap, Mechanism Design and Ideal Theories of Justice. And basically, I was reading this last night, and what, it, what this paper does is it analyzes the Boston Public Schools algorithm for allocating K-12 through students to different schools. So in Boston, apparently, in the public school system, um, you're not just going to the public school that's in your neighborhood you actually get to express your preferences of a staff rank of mm -hmm. different schools, and then somehow they take mm -hmm. this system of, of all of these preferences and spit out people's <coughs> assignments. And they, over many years and decades, have fine-tuned this algorithm to optimize not just for economic efficiency, but also to, op to optimize for ideals around fairness, and people not being able to gain the system. And so she talks about how um, this mechanism, this algorithm, can actually enact a theory of justice because it has all these normative values baked into the algorithm. And I guess she's not here to talk about it, but Paki, I would love to. Paki, this paper you have me read. Don't worry about My question to you is like, how do you use this for dating games? <laughs> like one one way to view all crypto projects is through this lens of they are all enacting a, a vision that they have of the world. Every startup is enacting a vision that it has of the world. What are the visions that you that find most compelling in crypto projects that we've met so far? Like are any of them enacting a sense of justice or any other set of ideals around ethics that you've observed? Since I since yeah. I said this question, I haven't a better time to think about it. So I can't. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of problems. Ask the questions. What you would like to respond to? This. Yeah, there are. This depends how broadly you define like kind of ethics and justice, but I, I'd like to hear your your answer. It's not a particularly organized answer, but I, I do think like in, in the last part of the cycle, like in the 2020 2021 time period, there were a lot of really <coughs> very interesting experiments being run by crypto projects that were trying to do like kind of economic redistribution through some novel crypto mechanism where maybe transaction fees would all get pulled together and then that would form the basis of like a UBI for all of the creators who are using a particular platform. Yeah. Um, I think this is one of the ideas behind Sona, the music streaming mm -hmm. application that's yeah. built on crypto rails, is like every time a music entity gets sold, some portion of that
that goes into Treasury, and that then gets distributed to like every every career on the platform. Um, so there's like a whole broad array of like interesting crypto mechanisms that have this like inbuilt view of distributed justice in them. Mm -hmm. Another example was a few years ago, also in music, uh, there was a project that was trying to build Harvard taxes okay. into um, into their NFT marketplace, where Harburger taxes are this idea described by um, Glenn Whale, uh, where in the book Radical Economics, where a Harburger tax is sort of in between private and public property, where anyone who owns an asset is uh, asked to basically appraise what they think the fair market value of that asset is and tax based on that value with the condition that they would also be willing to sell it at that value at any point in time. And so it's kind of this hybrid in between private ownership and public ownership because everything is theoretically on sale at any time and you're also paying taxes on your self-assessed property value. And so anyway, they were applying that idea of Harburger taxes to the music NFT space mm -hmm. um, and asking all of the music NFT owners to sell or appraise the worth of their music NFT. And then all of the funds paid for um, through those taxes would then go into like a giant pot and potentially be distributed back to creators. However, it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't work. And when I asked the founders why it didn't work, they said it was just too complicated for anyone to understand how it worked. Mm -hmm. If you can figure out how to abstract that, I think that's, I don't know how you think it's AI, like, you know, that does this, you know, your agent can write these things for you or something, but even the first example, it, like, brings to mind this idea that people always have, which is, like, why don't the YC founders just, like, all put a little bit of equity in the pot, and it's because there's adverse selection, and everybody thinks that they're the best, and, like, the best actual ones aren't going to want to put their equity in the pot, so maybe they don't do YC, and they yeah. and so I do think there's, like, a tension in crypto between it's not even attention, it's maybe just like all of a sudden this frustrating thing where you actually do have tools to bake some of these mechanisms like mm -hmm. into the protocol and the mechanism itself. Right. And then there's human nature on the other side where you go like, And cool. then there's market dynamics and too, then there's market where dynamics. the other NFT marketplaces aren't charging That's what it comes a lot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so like none of this exa exists in a vacuum. And, and in her paper, um, Zoe talks about how, yeah, when, when you're designing a mechanism to adhere to certain goals, around justice, the mechanism that you come up with actually differs from probably what is economically most efficient. Mm -hmm. And so this is the issue that arises when you try to create things like harbor taxes or a, a platform UBI for your users, is you're existing in a context where there's many other competitors who are just doing what is market optimal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the market optimal solution um, you know, tends to draw in more users and more traders because they they end up paying less. Do, do we have any uh, examples from like the past <coughs> 20 years of tech where the solution that was not economically the most optimized, but because it had the because it didn't fully specialize, right? Because it double specialized, specialized to economic efficiency, but also to serve some kind of value. Mm -hmm. But the one with the more value one. Um, I think this has happened in markets in which like cultural norms as a whole have shifted. Okay. So oftentimes consumers will choose not the cheapest option, but like the, the option that lowers their carbon emissions mm -hmm. or is more environmentally friendly. And that's because I think like cultural norms as a whole have shifted our consumption preferences to not just optimize for how much we're paying. Well, I think it's also kind of like I'm drawn back to your Audrey Lord quote of like the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So I'm kind of curious, like, what is the master's house and what is the master's tools in this situation we're talking about? Like, how even when we try to redesign the way a system works in order for the the con like the economics of it to serve like a more holistic human value. Yeah. What are the tools and what are what is the house? You well, know. yeah, when I say that, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about the house being, the master's house is capitalism and markets. Exactly. And the tools are um, financial tools. 
yeah or tools to create new assets. yeah and so in this context, crypto is definitely a tool of capitalism yeah because it exists in the broader context of markets. i think the carbon example that i brought up is interesting because it's it does it still exist within that broader context of capitalism but people have these like kind of they're holding two motivations in tandem with each other in balance. one is like the desire to pay low prices but the other is to like not destroy the planet and somehow as a society we've decided that both values are actually very important as consumers and so there are consumers who actually act against their own rational economic interests and pay for the slightly more expensive version and so a question that i've asked is how how did we get that cultural shift to happen and could it be applied to other other verticals, other other domains beyond just climate? i don't know if that if the climate one is 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 like maybe like as kind of norms change on things like i don't think it's nearly as durable as making a great product that's cheaper yeah and better like this has been my black pill is too strong a word like just green pill i guess on climate recently is like there are a lot of climate companies that say really nice things and if you have that like green tax the customers have to pay for too long and your business relies on it yeah i actually don't think you're gonna be a very successful climate company but like a lot of them are you know like i think sol agent is a really interesting example where they're like using advanced technology they make chemicals with biology essentially um and they can do it more cheaply because they have like just a new kind of like cutting edge technology that helps them to make chemicals that are greener and also cheaper yeah and so like that's the winning yeah solution there's like right it still has to adhere to the logic of the market it still has to adhere to the logic and that's like probably fine because then people like have to keep pushing until they figure out something that is actually just like that better because it's a better product it's a cheaper product and it's also clean like it's like a patagonia example right it's like it has to keep you warm patagonia is, yeah. yeah and patagonia like that is i guess it's like a great product and it's also part of their brand and it's something you wear and so you can say like versus something that that maybe is more hidden like part of the brand you're wearing because mm-hmm. patagonia is like i'm this kind of person just the same way you can go the first but like i think cultivated meat is like a really good example of this where like there will be a group of people who are willing to pay a bunch of money for this thing it's just like it's like outrageously more expensive right now but we found like and we'll write about them it's under nba for now but a company that actually figured out how to do cultured meat cheaper than factory farm meat wow. and like that's the fucking thing that's that is if you do that then like yeah. you're good and you need to figure out how to scale manufacturing there's a bunch of stuff there yeah but like i would rather and this is why i'm like my crypto philosophy is about how do you make capitalism more efficient because like right. i think that if you can speed up the path to like these kinds of solutions by incentivizing more people working on different problems like i i would love to launch a main point as a <laughs> I, i think that you know advanced advanced research and like crazy early you know early kind of like basic research is, is maybe in need of new funding mechanisms as universities are getting worse at doing that um and like i'd love to launch a new coin who's treasury funded like the craziest shit ever like the meme is like getting people aligned around this like yeah. the world that they want to see um and so then that's to me the most interesting thing about meme coins is that yeah. like you can make the meme anything and like right now it's dogs but can you plug in <laughs> other things right. um but i think that that's what's interesting about about it to me is that it's not like how do you build a mechanism that gets people to behave in a way that they don't want to yeah because they want over time economically yes. yes um i think that's this is a really great observation is like the winning product the winning service company etc like it still has to adhere to the logic of the market but they can also have this other value baked in totally. and this is something that i also very much observed in my work investing in creator economy startups um and i invested in a ton of businesses that profess to be more creator friendly or less extractive for creators um would allow users to um like direct payments towards creators more etc i invested in this instacart competitor that was less extractive towards the shoppers and what i learned is like the end user although they might care they don't care that much yeah they still choose the option that is best for them economically and so it, it, the value proposition really has to be and 
it's cheaper mm -hmm. and it's better for workers. It's cheaper and it's better for creators. It can't just be mm -hmm. more expensive and better for shoppers mm -hmm. because then that's a very small product, mm -hmm. a very small town. And it can, I do think there is value because some of these create, like some of these kind of projects can get there, like once they get the scale, but don't start that way. And so like yeah. having that to get your early customers, your early investors, like kicking off the flywheel and, and mm -hmm. you know, crypto can I think do this well as well. Like mm -hmm. a different way to kick off the early flywheel if you have an end goal in mind that is like actually because we did this, now we have all of the yeah. shoppers and I don't know, some other mm -hmm. thing that means that you don't switch from you know, attract to extract, but um, so then does this imply that trying to build a system that has some sort of redistribution, economic redistribution component using a crypto mechanism in the private sector is a futile endeavor because people just won't choose it from the get-go? I mean, like, I don't know that at the same time, like people, some, like, I don't think they're related, right? Like, I think you know, the Crypt of the Game was a, like a survivor like game show uh, that people paid 0.18 and there was an, I think it was an 81 8 pot, and you got an NFT if you lost and you were a judge and you could vote on the last night, and the people ended up voting to fund the Tornado Cash Legal Defense Fund. And so, like, there are these moments that you can rally around where people will act like out of goodness. Um, but I don't think that it's a sustainable thing. I think yeah, I the best path to UBI is probably that OpenAI like tries to beat off itself and push a bunch of uh, uh, money through UBI through Bitcoin. Like once the AGI takes over, like that to be the most probably viable path mm -hmm. towards a UBI. Yeah, I was thinking about that CTG crypto mm -hmm. game example, and I was thinking about like if you play this out as an iterative game, and this like continues to happen. I think people will probably stop playing yeah. the game because they'll recognize that this is just like a public campaign to uh, to lobby on behalf of whatever nonprofit cause. And if you can do that most effectively, you're just going to win the game. Okay. And so people are going to e just either decide, okay, I'm going to give my entry ticket um, cost to the nonprofit of my choice, mm -hmm. or like I'm just not going to play at all. Jobs to be done. I mean, you're in Telegram, a bunch of different people in okay. like crypto, you're yes. having fun for a little while. So I think if you like do that as non-economic, yeah. there are other jobs to be done in that game. But yeah, I agree. If you're trying to play that tool, like because you think that you have a better than you know one in eighty chance of one in eight, whatever it is, chance of winning, your EV is positive, and then people just end up like giving it away to charity every time, yeah. you probably stop. Yeah. But what about elite signaling? Because one one way one way you can sell you know, it's better, but it's more expensive, is if it becomes an elite signaling tool, right? I mean, from mm -hmm. impossible. Oh, like to yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Do, do you guys see that in crypto? Because crypto has a strong underdog mentality, but at the same time, it's very often the elites who play with it, mm -hmm. um, especially who become the face uh, faces of it. Um, do, you, do you think that in the crypto market, elite signaling works differently or the same as in, in the traditional markets? I, mean, I think, like, NFTs are, like the NFT craze in 2021 was like maybe the purest. You're, you're not even getting the loop done handbag, but you're just getting this thing that's yeah. pure Art collection. signaling yeah. to a wider audience. I don't know if you have more thoughts on it. I mean, the thing about Bedlam codes is that they have to be rare and scarce mm -hmm. in order to maintain their Bedlam status. And so, what? I think like so. Previous? It's great that when you're a multi millennial because we go for the premium <laughs> mediocre. Yeah, <laughs> true. I feel like that one good is the economic definition. The economic definition of Bedlam good is when the um, shape of the demand chart actually increases as the price increases. And most of the products you're talking about probably don't actually follow that demand chart. I read. Every school's only gotten more expensive, even the bad ones. Like, you <laughs> have to pay for a cheap school. Mm, yeah. Yeah, higher up there. We have, we have that sometimes from yeah, internet hosts who come from like a different national on this. You know, they're like, I'm not going to charge 40 bucks for my salon because my audience wouldn't come. It's too cheap for them. Yeah. They wouldn't assume that they get any value. Yep. Mm -hmm. Everyone, charge everyone. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think it's a good status because we have to be better. Right? Like I, I personally think like everything is sad script. Like yeah. you know, like 
you get wine on a date, you know, like, do people really like the wine? You know, it's like, you know, it's like everything is status. It's not I think, for, it, I think for, for this idea to be applicable to, um, like, what we're talking about mm -hmm. in the realm of, like, distributive justice, I think we have to shift, like, cultural mores more broadly to, in order to shift what is high status. So I was listening to this NPR podcast a while ago, which talked about how in ancient Greece, it was actually a status symbol to pay taxes. Because not everyone paid taxes, only the elites paid taxes. Yes, we know. There you go. <laughs> and there's so, a whole ground for it. And so people would like publicly talk and celebrate <laughs> how much they pay taxes. And I was like, how counter, how perverse. Um, <laughs> Right, like, oh, I just, I'm so tired, I found it this children's hospital today. <laughs> <laughs> right. Keeping your donations on chain, I guess, is a good, yeah, yeah like, a, yeah. the biggest donor site, I don't know if anyone actually go to it. Like, I just think, it's like, proof, right, because, you know, that's where so many things, when you see a philanthropy, there's a wall, and there's donors, and it's like, it's not like so in your face, but it's like, very yeah. clear. <laughs> you know, there's three of them, and you know, the mystical, and, and everyone understands, like, oh, if you're over here, like, yeah. you may pay less than these people over here, like, we're going to celebrate that. Do you think there's a way to do, do, <laughs> do distributive justice with all three goals? That, oh, gosh. Like, in, in a durable, in like a durable way. I'm still figuring that out myself. Like, I haven't seen that to date yeah. in a durable way. Yeah. I've seen little bits here and there. But, no, I, I return to that Audrey Ward quote. Like, I, I think it's really challenging because people don't have the incentives to do that. Yeah. Like, uh, going back to the Boston Public School algorithm and, like, what are counterparts of crypto that try to enact an economic mechanism on chain or, like, in the crypto world, like I was thinking of other examples, you could say every token distribution event, every airdrop mm -hmm. is a mechanism that has values baked into it in terms of who you think is most deserving of tokens, yeah. of, of free money falling from the sky. But they're usually designed in a way to make them, to make the network most market competitive, mm -hmm. not to enact a specific theory of justice. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean like the, I think retroactive public ghost funding mm -hmm. could be an example of it. I actually think that like L1 treasuries might actually be the best source of this because you have all of this money that's meant to attract people and you do that like kind of however you want it. So it might be paying developers, but it might also be saying like, we're the best, you know, like we put aside 10% yeah. of our treasury and we are giving it to like, we are fucking curing hunger in Africa. Yeah. And no matter what, and like you, you think that's like the best way to rally people to your cause? Like I almost like this idea of these like three pools of money that do something that doesn't have to be like particularly tied to a result. I think large venture fund mansion fees are like another interesting one that where you can just like kind of invest in the ecosystem and like know that it'll come back to you somehow mm -hmm. if you get that trade right. And I think probably L1 and treasuries are the closest right. thing to that. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing that I was gonna mention as an example is like whenever fundraise and decide how much allocation is going to go towards investors versus the team versus the community. Yeah. That is actually an expression of some like a decision they have made about what is fair, what is a fair allocation. Not necessarily what's fair, but actually <laughs> what the market thinks is fair. <laughs> what the market thinks is fair and will tolerate. Yes, yeah, exactly. What they like think the the is fair. It's like this counterbalance of how do I extract as much value and keep it for myself. Yes. <laughs> Versus, how do I do that without pissing off the market such that no one will use yeah. my project? It's this balancing act of how do I make the pie the largest, but also make sure my share of the pie is the largest. How do I fake the pie share? There's this That's great. definitely the wrong chain, Matt. Did you see this? <laughs> Literally faking the pie share yeah. to make the pie sizes different. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's, right, there's a lot of incentives at play in crypto of like, how big can I make my share of the pie while also ensuring that the pie overall is not diminished yeah. in size. Which is interesting, an interesting thing to figure out in its own right, kind yeah. of. But yeah, a I different agree. thing that I'm trying to get. Yeah. And I guess, like, yeah, I think that does tie back to the idea of distributive justice because it's, I mean, the whole idea of distributive justice is like, what are the set of 
principles for how we allocate goods and services throughout society in a way that everyone will be able to tolerate and get behind these principles. Yeah, sure. And so the way that the market shapes token allocations or token airdrops, um, given the existence of many such airdrops or many such token allocations, does trend towards what is acceptable by the most number of people. Yeah, and so that way last year. Yeah. Okay, I think that's a good place to park it. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. <laughs>